Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Music Monday at Govins Presbyterian Church. We are so glad that you joined us tonight. Music Monday has is a great opportunity that we've had and will have in the future at Govins Presbyterian to host a wide variety of musicians and just in a, in a way that you never really could um, if we all had to gather in a physical place. We get to hear so many different kinds of musicians together and connect across uh, geography and and all over the place. So it's really great that you're here tonight, and we're so glad to be able to host this at uh, Govins Presbyterian Church. Um, as you know, or some of you may know, Music Monday was founded by Leah Gilmore, who is the First Service Music Director at Govins Presbyterian Church and the Minister of Racial Justice at Govins Presbyterian. And we continue to keep Leah in our prayers as she recovers from her stroke, which happened about a month ago now. She is home from intensive inpatient rehab and continues to do outpatient rehab from her home, uh, getting better every single day, speech getting better, um, physical strength getting better. So she is on the road to recovery, but we will continue to keep her in our prayers. Before we introduce our guest tonight, I'm gonna ask Maria Wong from Common Ground on the Hill to say a little bit about that organization. Good evening, everybody. My name is Maria Wong, and I am a member of Govins Presbyterian Church. I also work for the nonprofit arts organization Common Ground on the Hill, which is underwriting support for Govins Music Monday performers. We are recording tonight's program as part of our work as a Maryland Folklife Center of the Maryland State Arts Council. The video will be archived on the Common Ground on the Hill official YouTube channel, where you can find other Govins Music Monday programs and many other videos. While you're on YouTube, also check out the Govins Presbyterian Church YouTube channel, which includes recordings of sermons and the Govins Racial Justice Speaker Series. There is a lot of great stuff, so I hope you'll take a look. And now back to you, Tom. Thank you. One of the great things that we do in this format at Music Monday is if you have any questions for the artist as we go along tonight, you're welcome to put them in the chat box. And I, uh, as the host, will well, offer them uh, to Earl and uh, see what kind of wisdom and uh, insight he has to answer to any questions you may have. Otherwise, we will just let him kind of run the show and share his music with us. Let me tell you a little bit about him. Earl White is an award-winning musician rooted in the practice, teaching, and sustaining of American string band traditions. Uh, he has a lifetime commitment to sharing this music and to keeping these traditions alive. He's been a prominent figure in the old time music and dance community for more than 40 years. And he's one of the few African Americans playing and perpetuating the music that was once an essential part of black culture and black communities across the US. We are thrilled to have Earl White with us tonight. Thank you Earl for, be for being here. Please take it away. Well, thank you very much, Tom. And I wanna put a reach out and a thank to all of you for all of your prayers uh, for um, Leah. It seems like uh, a lot of those prayers are being answered and um, I'm keeping my toes and my fingers crossed that she has a speedy recovery. Um, <clears throat> well, as Tom pointed out, I'm Earl White. I'm currently living in Floyd, Virginia, moved here uh, roughly about five years ago from um, Santa Cruz, California. And um, I chose early retirement <laughs> five years ago, 2016. But I got to tell you, retirement is overrated. I'm working way harder now than I did before I, before I moved. I'm a retired respiratory therapist. Um, shortly after we moved here, we couldn't find any bread like we liked. So uh, my wife, Adrian, and I built a bakery on our farm. And, um, and to our surprise, people have been coming out of the woods, coming out of the woodwork, and the demand for our product has been really good. But, you know, what do you expect? If it's a good product, that's basically what happens. I also want to say, unfortunately, Adrian was going to uh, join me for this, but uh, she woke up this morning and she's been a little bit under the weather, so she's taking a a break and been pretty much sleeping all day in recovery mode. So I want to start this out. I haven't played solo in a really long time, but 
it kind of brings back memories of um, when I was uh, working at the University of Virginia Medical Center, uh, there was a children's hospital in Charlottesville. And a lot of what I would do sometimes is I'd go over there and I would play for the kids at the children's hospital. In fact, I invented the wheelchair square dance. Well, it was wheelchairs and stretchers where the uh, staff would push the kids around and I would teach square dancing and, and play tunes. Well, I kind of had it in my head that, well, if I had five tunes on the fiddle, which I had a hundred on the fiddle and five tunes on the guitar and five tunes on the banjo, I could take up a good hour's worth or actually longer of time. So I want to start this out with a tune for any uh, fiddlers out there or for any aspiring fiddlers. Uh, my tuning on this tune is in A-E-A-E. Um, -E -A -E. So I'm in a, what they call a cross tune um, on my fiddle. I want to play a tune called You Piney Mountain. It's been one of my favorite fiddle tunes now for, whoa, for a, seems like forever, but there are many that fall in that category. You Piney Mountain. Thank you. 
you piney mountain <laughs> thank you thank you very much you know i went on a um i don't know if some of you might have heard some of my history along the line but uh i was one of the founding and original members of the uh green grass cloggers and in those adventures that's basically how i ended up um playing old time music and the fiddle in particular. I guess I started out playing a little bit of, I wanted to play banjo, didn't have a banjo, but it, I was visiting a friend who would, yeah, was into scrug style, three finger picking banjo. And it was odd because during that period of time when, the, when we first started dancing as cloggers, we initially danced only to bluegrass music. So we danced behind Bill Monroe, we danced behind, all the big bluegrass bands did, all the big bluegrass festivals. And then one day we were traveling between gigs and was rolling down Route 81 and happened to see a sign that said, Galax, Virginia, home of the world's oldest fiddlers convention. And of course, you know, we pulled in to check it out. Well, as we're standing there and hardly standing there because most of us had these little dancing boards that we called a step -a tune and we would take those dancing boards and generally wherever there was a bluegrass jam, we'd take our boards, throw, throw them down and just start clogging. And as it was, we followed suit, jumped out of our bus, pulled up to the first uh, bluegrass jam, threw our um, boards down and just started dancing. Well, in between tunes in this far part of the festival ground, there was this buzzing sound that sounded like bumblebees in a jug. Yeah. And we were like, what is that? Well, needless to say, a bunch of us went in search of that sound. And what we found was back in the far corner of the festival ground, they had, and because it was at a fairground, they had uh, stalls where they kept uh, uh, horses and uh, cows and, you know, basically prize animals for the fair. And there we saw Tommy Jarrell and Fred, Fred Crockerham, you know, these uh, basically old time guys from Western North Carolina just hanging out playing tunes. Well, we met people like the, a group called Swamp Root. We met some of the uh, early uh, Highwood String Band people. And out of that, oh my goodness, it was an instant marriage between uh, the Greengrass Cloggers and old time music. And it seems like from that point forward, we just started dancing. Um, doing more folk festivals, things like the Philadelphia Folk Festival, the um, Wolf Trap Festival, but either way, we were paired a lot with the uh, Highwood String Band, the Hot Mud Family, um, the Red Clay Ramblers, a lot of the bands that were pretty much touring during that time playing old time music. Well, I was fascinated by the Fiddlers and it wasn't until 1975 we were dancing in Evergreen Valley, Maine. And, you know, and it's amazing because as Greengrass Cloggers, we were paired with some of the most unusual uh, groups or bands. So we were dancing in Evergreen Valley, Maine, and there was uh, Seals and Crofts, uh, members of Jefferson Airplane, Little Feet, Alice Cooper, and the Greengrass Cloggers. <laughs> and it was... The experience that I had was seeing, I was in the green room and there was a black fiddler who played with both Little Feet and Jefferson Airplane. His name was Papa John Creech. And he was just sitting in the corner, just playing the instrument as a fiddle. Well, you know, I had seen in my travels and growing up in Newark, New Jersey, I'd seen many uh, black violinists but never actually having seen a live black person playing the instrument as a fiddle. And I looked at him and I said, wow, I want to do that. I want to do that. And 1975, Christmas of 1975, my best friend brought me a fiddle that belonged to her uncle. No, no it belonged to her brother-in-law's uncle's grandfather. And it had been ordered through the Seals and Roebuck catalog some 100 plus years ago. But anyway, they said I could use it. And from that point forward, it became an appendage. And <laughs> here I am. <clears throat> so moving right along, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you 
how I also came to a collector of fiddle tunes. But before I do that, I want to play you another tune. So I generally tell people that, you know, music is a bridge. Music can get you in trouble and it can also get you out of trouble. Well, it got me very much out of trouble once. Uh, I was a traveling respiratory therapist and I used to travel up and down Route 81 um, between New York and Virginia. And when I first started playing the fiddle, my bowing style was, was a long bow style. And I would hear people saying from time to time, playing at festivals in the dark, don't stand on that guy's right side because he'll beat the devil out of you with his right hand. <laughs> First, I didn't quite know how to take that, but anyway, I laughed it off. But anyway, as a result of driving that route between New York and, um, and Virginia, I would play my fiddle. I would play my fiddle while I was driving. And I used to have this nice little bare spot where the hair had rubbed off on my left knee from steering with my knee. Well, fortunately, Route 81 didn't have a lot of curves, mostly like gentle curves. Well, there I was cruising down Route 81 and I had my window up because if I had the window down, I had to crank the radio, the uh, CD player up really, really high just to hear the music. And a lot of it, because I was in my learning stage, I was basically mimicking what I was hearing. So there I was playing away and what I didn't realize was that the faster the tune, the faster I was driving. I just wasn't aware of the fact that my foot was just down on the metal like that. So anyway, I happened to look over and there was a patrol car right next to me. And the guy looked at me and he just shook his head and he motioned for me to pull over. Of course, you know, I was just scared, shaking in my boots. And I just knew he was going to put me under the jail. Well, the guy walks up, officer walks up, and he looks at me and he says, now, son, please tell me that I, I didn't see you playing the fiddle. I've been tracking you now for some 10, 15 miles, and you were cruising at 95. Well, my fiddle was on the seat, so I, I just said, yes, officer, you did. You saw me play. I was playing the fiddle. I'm really, really sorry, but I was playing the fiddle. And he turned around. And he started walking to walk away and he said, just get out of the car, get out of the car. So I got out of the car and I started to follow him again. I'm shaking in my boots thinking, oh no, oh no, what have I done? And he looks at me and he turns, he turns around and he looks at me and he says, no, bring your fiddle. I, I don't even know how to write this. <laughs> just bring your fiddle. So I grabbed my fiddle, walked over to his patrol car. And generally what they do, is they, if they're stopping someone, they will open their intercom in case they need to call for help. So he opened his intercom and he said, now play me a fiddle tune. Um, you know, I need to know that you can really play that thing. At which point I played him this tune and it's called Devil in the Straw Stack. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Devil in the Straw Stack. <laughs> it was amazing because at the end of the tune, I could hear those, I could hear his buddies just clapping in the background. And he looks at me and says, Well, by God, you can play that thing. And I said, Well, thank you, officer. And so he looks at me and he says, Now, again, I don't even know how to write this up, but I pulled you over, so I got to give you a ticket for something. So I looked around and says, How about I give you a ticket for defective equipment? <laughs> I was like, defective. I don't have any defective equipment. Yes, you do. You have a broken tail light, <laughs> which I didn't, but I accepted it. I said, okay, all right, I'll take the ticket. And I looked at him and he, he looked at me and he said, now, son, I'm going to tell you now, I've been driving this route for some 40 plus years. And by God, I've never seen, you know, this is the, this is the real first for me. If I ever see you playing the fiddle on my route while driving again, I will make sure you get put under the jail. And of course, I gracefully thanked him and said, thank you, officer. You will never, ever, ever see me playing the fiddle on your post ever again. And so I got in my car and I took off and I started driving. And when I got about 50 miles down the road, I picked up my fiddle and I finished my tune. <laughs> And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. But uh, I say those were the days. Uh, once I got married and started having kids, I uh, didn't do that anymore. <laughs> but anyway, so I started playing the fiddle again in 1975. And, you know, dancing around and cruising around with the cloggers. Um, you know, for 17 years, I did that. I dropped out of college to uh, be a starving clogger. In fact, 14 of us dropped out of college uh, because there was so much demand it, peer, it appeared for uh, the green grass cloggers. And it got down to the point where out of 24 out of 30 people, you know, some of us had to make the commitment to do it. And I was the one, one, one of the people that raised my hand to do that. Well, needless to say, in all of our travels, it just never saw many people of color playing the instrument at all. I mean, all the fiddlers conventions we went to, all the festivals we played at, you know, there just weren't a lot of people of color. And I'm going to say playing old time string band music. And so um, a number of years ago, I went on a search for black fiddlers and of which uh, I didn't find many, I found one, um, two. Uh, there was a guy, uh, Clarence Gatemouth Brown. Uh, I saw him and talked to him a little bit at Union Grove. I went to uh, uh, visit uh, Black Fiddler out of Mebane, North Carolina, Joe Thompson. And one of my questions for, you know, to both of those guys, or in particular to Tom, um, Joe Thompson was, well, where are the people that you played with? Yeah, you know, because what I was hoping to find was that there were other people, especially young people in his community who would basically take up the tradition and continue it. Well, none such, he said, told me that either the, you know, most of his cousins and the people that he played with had all died and that he had one grandson who every time he took out his fiddle, he had an interest, he would get up and dance. So that particular grandson to look promising. Well, again, in my search, what I found was that there were a lot of fiddle tunes, a lot of fiddle tunes that I had been playing for years that had pretty, very much come right out of the Black community. And um, needless to say, uh, the people, the, the, the sources for a lot of those tunes, you know, the people were not necessarily giving credit for us for it. Um, we were dancing at the Angiers Festival once, and the Bill Monroe Band was backing us up. And Bill Monroe walks up to me and he says, you know, you remind me a lot of this fella that I used to play with many, many, many years ago. But he didn't mention a name. And so, again, in my search, I find out that there's this guy, his name is Arnold Schultz. And uh, he was had been credited for... Uh, basically playing a lot with Bill Monroe, being responsible for Bill Monroe, getting his first gig, which was playing for a square dance. And later on, again, in my search for Black Fiddlers, you know, I started to find more and more 
information about Bill Monroe and his association with Arnold Schultz and how he was very, very uh, much influenced by the playing and from playing with Arnold Schultz. And then you find people like um, Leslie Riddle, who traveled a lot, around a lot with A.P. Carter from the Carter family. Well, Leslie Riddle, basically for A.P., was the gateway into the Black community and a lot of the mountainous communities in the area that he lived in. And, um, you know, from what I, some of his writings was that the Carters were not very prolific writers, but they basically had a tendency to go into these communities and then whatever they came across, they would basically make it their own. So anyway, I'm still searching. <laughs> I'm doing a nationwide search. I know they're out there somewhere, but, um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the reason that you can't find them is because there's not a lot of documentation. There's not a lot of credit given to a lot of the black fiddlers and a lot of the uh, old time string band music that comes out of the black, that had come out of the black community. <clears throat> so with that, I'm going to play you this tune here. It's called Riley and Spencer. And it has to do with uh, prohibition times. Uh, these two towns in North Carolina, uh, Riley, <laughs> I'm going to say Riley and Spencer, but it may very well be Raleigh and Spencer. And part of it is like people like me, yeah, you know, growing up when I was first starting to play the fiddle, yeah, you know, we were listening a lot to old, old 78s. And, you know, when it was somebody playing who hardly had any teeth, it sounded like either Riley and Spencer or Riley and Spencer. <laughs> so, you have a choice. I've seen it written both ways, Raleigh and Spencer and Riley and Spencer. And it sounds something like this. And for any aspiring fiddlers out there, the tuning on this one is uh, uh, D, A, D, D. So there's a lot of D in this tune. And um, I like it kind of gives that, gives the fiddle a nice little haunting sound or texture to it, so. Tell more of them doggone lies. 
I'll tell more than doggone lies. and spencer or thank riley you. thanks for you earl yes we're loving loving the music loving the storytelling i just want to remind everybody that maria has put the virtual tip jar in the chat room and so if you'd like to express your appreciation to earl there for with uh, a virtual tip it turns into real money for him and uh, i'm sure he would appreciate that very much and uh there's no questions i think everybody's just enthralled with your music and your storytelling so go right ahead well thank you so much thank you thank you all right so um i'm going to show you this little figure here and again relative to my search for black fiddlers um this is a guy that um whoops was gifted to me by a good friend a green grass clogger doug baker the late doug baker and he gifted this guy for me because he knew in my search for black fiddlers and he happened to be going through South Carolina and he happened upon uh, this town in South Carolina that celebrated this guy. Nobody seemed to know his real name. They called him Trotting Sally. And they called him Trotting Sally because he had a tendency to race the horses that uh, carried uh, vegetables and various other things uh, through the town. And uh, Trotting Sally was one of those guys who, he played the fiddle. Uh, I have not been able to find any recordings of him. But um, again, the uh, article that was sent along with it was, the only reference was that he liked to race horses. <laughs> Trotting Sally. And to that, I want to introduce you to this little, this young guy. So this is me. And in uh, after I moved to Floyd, Virginia, it turns out, and one of the reasons I moved here was number one for the water. The groundwater is really good. And also, uh, we're pretty much surrounded by old time music. Well, uh, I started going to the Floyd Country Store and playing, and um, this lady happened to be there who makes these lumberjacks, lumberjacks of local musicians. And so she politely walked up to me and said, hey, can you, uh, do you mind if I, this is what I do, do you mind if I make one for you? 
make one of you? And I said, of course not. Well, of course it was winter. I was wearing a, a wool hat toboggan <laughs> and I had a beard. And so she came back and this is what she came at, came, uh, gave to me. It's a limberjack, um, the arm swing, and it will basically dance. And uh, yeah, like I said, unfortunately, uh, Adrian wasn't able to, to uh, join me, but um, I had asked him if he would dance for us today. And he said, yes, but then, you know, I have no way of playing and having him dance at the same time. So this is me. This is Fiddling Earl White. Speaking of Fiddling Earl White, so that name was coined by a friend of mine, uh, Lightning Wells, Mike Lightning Wells out of uh, North Carolina. And every time I saw him, he would call me Fiddling Earl White, Fiddling Earl White. And then he started to shorten that to few. And at first I thought he was being derogatory, but what I thought about it, Fiddling Earl White. Oh yeah, F-E-W. And you know, and that kind of rang a loud bell for me because, you know, when I really thought about it, when it comes to actual black fiddlers living and playing the old time music today, there are few of us. And um, out of that, you know, I was like, okay, I'll wear that handle. <laughs> It seems suitable. And with that note, I'm going to play a banjo tune for you here. This is in G modal for any of you banjo uh, players out there. Uh, it's a song that um, you probably have heard uh, Doc Watson and various other bluegrass people do a lot. It's called Little Sadie. And I sing this song, I sing it considerably slower than those guys sing it, because unfortunately, you know, throughout the world and world history, there's been like just a lot of violence, a lot of violence against people, between people, a lot of violence against women. And so when I've heard other people sing this song, it's all pumped up like they're really happy. And I'm like, wait a minute, no, that's not something to be happy about. It's a sad song. <laughs> so I'm going to sing it as sadly as I possibly can. It's called Little Sadie. Said young man, your name Brown, we 
Remember the night you just sat him down. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, moving right along there. Got another uh, little fiddle tune here I want to play for you. Uh, and this one's in. This one is in the D Dad tuning also. And it's called uh, Midnight on the Water. Uh, yeah, I don't want to do that on the water. I'll do Bonaparte's Retreat. Oh, generally sounds better when it's really in tune.
time. Midnight on the water. Thank you, Earl. Thank you. Thank you. Thank we, you very much. Uh, we have a question from the in the chat room. Oh, okay. Uh, from Deb Smith is wondering uh, what you were studying when you dropped out of college and where were you going to school at the time? I was in school. I was at East Carolina University, and I my pursuit at that time was I uh, wanted to be an actor. And um, you might remember that uh, series that was on television, uh, Hogan's Heroes. And I had an aunt who uh, went to school, went to college with the black guy uh, that was in, the, in that show. And um, I was so impressed by, you know, by that, that I decided that's what I wanted to be. Ivan Dixon was his name. And I decided I wanted to be an actor. Well, what I decided to, my approach to that was I would major in psychology because if I, I thought if you want, if I had a degree in psychology, I could portray all these different, uh, uh, if you wanted schizophrenia, I could give you that. If you wanted happy, I could give you that. If you, whatever the case may be, I could portray all these different uh, uh, actors or uh, characters. And so what ended up happening was when I started clogging, it took me a little while to realize that, you know, and here I was living my dream of being in entertainment, but it just wasn't the route that I thought that I was going to do. So yeah. that's what I was doing, uh, studying at that time. <laughs> All right. Hi, Walt. And, uh... Uh, Maria has uh, noticed that you the use of the drone in your music, and she says, "Are these tunes adapted from Mountain Dulcimer tunes, or is there are there is there a relation between them?" Yes, there is a relation between them. So um, you notice a lot of the uh, old time tunes come right also out of the uh, West Virginia, uh, Western North Carolina uh, that region where you had a lot of people of Irish and Scottish descent. Well, a lot of times when they couldn't, um, uh, you notice with a bagpipe or even with a, uh, a concertina, you have a constant drone and then the notes would dance around that. Well, especially coming out of uh, West Virginia and when you tune that fiddle, like where this one is tuned in cross tune A-E-A-E, -E, uh, part of the essence of, of the tune is keeping that drone. So, um, you know, that's, pretty much that association there. Also, a lot of it too was, um, you know, black slaves living on plantations. You know, if you played music and a lot of times the, uh, the uh, plantation owners would either teach or share the music with, uh, or with um, uh, slaves, because if these slaves yeah, learn the music, then they could be commodities to, uh, they were commodities, but they could be rented out to other plantations to um, uh, to entertain and play music. Well, the result was that a lot of these slave musicians also were the ones who had more of an opportunity to escape traveling between one plantation to another. And when it comes to the Appalachian region, well, the place that a lot of these is, uh, black musician slaves found refuge was in the Appalachians and especially in the mountains. Uh, the uh, Native Americans took a lot of men, a lot of the uh, Scott and Irish, more Irish who were settled into the hills were also people who um, were considered the lowest of the low. 
And so, you know, they found, basically they found common ground with these people and, and invited them in and, in and gave them refuge. Well, you know, blacks playing the instruments and now joining with the, uh, the Scotch and the Irish and, and joining those traditions, that's where a lot of that basically comes out of it, comes from. Wow, wow, that's great. I, I knew I liked this kind of music for a reason. That's my, Scot my Scotch-Irish heritage, ter <laughs> I guess. Right. Um, right. <laughs> gonna, we're gonna let you uh, close out within the next uh, seven minutes or so. I wanna just okay. welcome anybody who's not familiar with Govins to uh, any other ways that you want to connect with us? Maria has put some information about how to connect with Govins and get on our email list in the chat box. And you can do that and find more about Music Mondays and all the other kinds of programming we do. This is going to be our last Music Monday for a while. We're going to take a little bit of a hiatus as Leah heals. And still she's back and uh, ready to inspire us with um, more and more gifted musicians. But for, for now, you are going to be our, our last Music Monday for a while. So why don't you... Uh, uh, give us whatever you like for the next uh, five, five or six minutes before we close out. Okay, so you know I moved here. I bought a farm in Floyd, Virginia, uh, about ten years ago, and for the first five years living in California, we were pretty much back and forth. We would try to come and and uh, feel the essence of every season in this area. And then, um, as I said earlier, 2016, I chose early retirement. And we just packed up and moved to Floyd, Virginia. Well, <laughs> what I realized is it gets cold here. It's not California. Last <laughs> couple of weeks ago, we had 13 inches of snow. And I walked out and I looked at it and I was like, oh, no, this is not California. <laughs> it was a rude awakening. But anyway, we're surviving. Uh, our bakery is just kicking our butts. Uh, you can check us out at uh, BigIndianFarm.com. And I, we have 72 acres here. And out of that, you know, there's a lot of pastures. So I'm also raising Icelandic sheep uh, for the purpose of uh, eating the grass so I don't have to cut it. But what I find is that the sheep don't eat much. <laughs> like, oh, they don't eat very much at all. But um, that's what we do apart from that, doing uh, music and, uh, and basically just assimilating into the uh, into the Floyd community. Um, and speaking of it not being California, here's a song um, I learned by way of um, uh, Doc Boggs. And what I later found out was that uh, he too was one of those mus musicians who spent a lot of time in the Black community learning and playing uh, with Black musicians and uh, trading tunes and and whatnot, but this is a tune called the Down South Blues. And one of my uh, favorite lines in it is, I'm going where the weather suits my clothes. Well, of course, living in California, when we first moved here, we did not have winter clothes. <laughs> it hardly rained in California, so we didn't have boots, raincoats, or anything like that. So it's been a it's been a odd transition, but we're doing it. This is uh, the Down South Blues. I'm going to catch the fastest train that goes Cause I'm going down south Where the weather it suits my clothes Yes, I'm going to the country. I'm going to wear out 99 
pair of shoes Cause I'm broken hearted I've got those down south blues told me and my papa he told me to don't you go out rambling let those girls make a fool out of you station I'm gonna catch the fastest train that goes cause I'm going down south where the weather it suits my clothes Down South Blues. <laughs> thank you. Want to thank everybody for tuning in. Want to thank Govins for inviting me and uh, Leah. Good to see all you folks. See thank you, you soon. so much, Earl.